Hello, this is the American Medical Association's Moving Medicine video and podcast. Today, we're talking to Dr. Peter Cohen, an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and an internist at Cambridge Health Alliance about what physicians need to know about dietary supplements to help keep patients safe. He's calling in from Brookline, Massachusetts. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Um, Dr. Cohen, Dietary supplementation regulation has been an issue for a long time, way before the pandemic, but how did the pandemic exacerbate the issue? Well, during the pandemic, Todd, there's been a bunch of changes, uh, obviously, to all of our lives. And some of those have had dramatic effects on, on sales of supplements and the use of supplements. Of course, one is that during the earlier months of the pandemic, during the lockdown, it was hard to access care. So uh, the approach to self-medicating, uh, especially one where you could uh, purchase something right off of Amazon, have it delivered to your house, uh, you know, it became, became extremely attractive, uh, even more so than before. The other thing was that the ability of supplements to advertise themselves as um, preventive or treatment or immune boosters, that sort of ability, that, 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 that option in the law created a lot of opportunities for marketing these products for um, Americans who, who were worried about their health during these uh, very, very difficult times. Yeah, we've seen that, you know, that issue with like immune boosters in relation to colds and all sorts of other stuff. I, I think, you know, a lot of people think that supplements are carefully regulated. Can you explain exactly how they're regulated, uh, if at all? Yeah. So, they certainly are regulated. The FDA is, in, is responsible for regulating dietary supplements. We might think of them because they're health products as being a subcategory of medication. But in fact, the FDA regulates them as a subcategory of food. This has huge consequences for um, the whole category of dietary supplements from vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and all sorts of uh, new ingredients. And what it means is that the manufacturer can introduce anything into the market that they believe is safe. And the FDA's job is to identify the products that are causing harm after they've been on the market and remove them from store shelves. So that sounds like a, a place for possible reform. Can you talk about, you know, when, when you look at reform, what are kind of the elements of that? Well, the problem that we've had um, recently, in recent years especially, is that there's been an explosion of new ingredients. So it's not only that we're worried about the ingredients that are legal and permitted in supplements or historically used in supplements for many, many years. So there are many of these ingredients. Um, these are individual compounds found in botanicals or other um, substances that can pose health risks. But nowadays we're seeing so many new innovations or new and brand new ingredients being introduced to supplements. Again, because the FDA isn't vetting these products before they show up on store shelves or on the internet, what happens is that they can pose unpredictable risks. So we need to work on reform. We need to work on ways to uh, strengthen the FDA's ability to limit what comes onto the market, to have a safety gauge, to make sure that dangerous, potentially dangerous products don't appear in store shelves. And when they do, that they can rapidly be taken off the market. So we're really gonna need to see a lot of changes in order to um, deal with this uh, very actively evolving um, uh, healthcare products. I'm curious because, you know, obviously you're saying there's been an increase uh, and these things, is there the capacity to do that kind of evaluation? Um, that, that's a big challenge right now. So right now, there's a, the FDA is completely overwhelmed by, well, we don't even know how many products are out there, but the estimates are that there are greater than 75,000 different dietary supplement products on the market. There's no way the FDA can get a handle on even what's out there, much less what's um, which of those are dangerous unless they are given new tools. And we're probably going to need to see some significant changes to the law made to give those, to give the agency the tools they need, but they'll also of course need the funding to, um, operationalize it, to enforce the, uh, the law. Now it's uh, interesting because I'm, you know, very into fitness and health, uh, obviously. Um, and I do 
you know, see a lot of this stuff show up in my Instagram feed. There's almost like a template uh, that uh, supplements like this will follow with a little video explaining kind of what the problem is. And here's this new solution. Do you think uh, that the marketers of these products are getting increasingly sophisticated in the digital age? Absolutely. And that's become a big, um, another big problem nowadays with, with the internet and with the social media is that even the um, very lax rules around promoting a supplement um, are being really pushed the limit to the point where their supplements are not, for example, let me give you one example, is that a supplement is not supposed to be able to advertise as if it will help treat an illness or a, um, a disease. Unfortunately, because of the way social media is, it's very easy to link testimonials or little posts or tweets with things that will suggest to consumers like um, and also micro target consumers who have diabetes, for example, and that this supplement might be useful to uh, maintain healthy sugar levels. So if you're targeting an audience, a specific audience that um, the marketer already knows uh, very well likely has diabetes, and then you're giving, sending them these messages on social media or advertisements on social media that suggest that this supplement will maintain normal sugar levels. You can see that th th that has all the appearance, 100% of the appearance for the uh, consumer that this product will be able to treat their diabetes. So basically the, the social media um, environment, it really uh, permits the companies and manufacturers and others to promote these products as if they're treatments for disease. And that is particularly a, a, an insidious problem for, um, for, for patients. Do you think uh, that there's been an increase in, I'll call them just fountain of youth type uh, approaches, uh, kind of different supplements to, you know, keep, keep people quote young? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, the supplements are being promoted for just about everything today, but absolutely. If you look at any, uh, any sphere, you, you'll just be amazed whether or not it's preventing aging to improving cognitive you know, function, make, you know, be able to think better versus, and also to a lot of things that are related to illnesses. So helping people deal with opioid addiction or uh, relaxing without the effects of, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, how to relax with CBD without the effects of THC, you know, these kind of um, things are going on and each of these markets is just exploded. Um, so it, it's really, um, it, it's really remarkable what's happening today in the supplement. Well, so a uh, question for you, you know, what is a physician to do? I don't think this is something they cover uh, necessarily in medical school, but I'm sure the physicians are probably fielding questions all the time uh, from their patients about, you know, perspective effects of this. How do you advise physicians in this realm? What should they be watching for? What should they be telling their patients? Well, I think it's, uh, really important to just keep in mind that most of our patients are taking supplements, whether or not they have told us about it or not, uh, more than 50% of the U S adults are taking supplements. So it's important for us to recognize that most of our supplement, uh, most of our patients are using supplements. So we need to ask about it. Now, um, I, I think one perception that I had, because I also didn't learn about supplements when I was in medical school was that these must be, expensive placebos, things that if a patient's taking it, fine, like I don't need to worry about it because it's not going to affect their health. It's not going to affect um, their, uh, their medications. Well, what we've come to realize is that because the supplements are so often formulated much more closer to drugs, that it's incredibly important for us to pay attention to what our patients are taking and to recognize that they might be causing direct immediate effects on our patients. So um, it, it's really important to have an open mind with patient, with our patients so that they, and um, be non-judgmental when talking about supplements. Cause if we come in kind of like, oh, you're not taking any weight loss supplements, are you? We're, um, you know, they, they're gonna clam up and, and not share with us what's going on. So I, I really encourage uh, docs to say, you know, a lot of my patients are struggling with uh, 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 weight, have chosen to try some 
weight loss supplements. Have, have you tried any? So I really like to, to try to encourage a, a open conversation, find out what people are taking. Because once you find out about that, you can realize that you, and you, you learn about what the patients are taking, it might be affecting their immediate health. It might be contributing to palpitations or uh, panic attacks, or more seriously, something uh, as serious as, as hepatitis or even a stroke. So it, it's, it's these open-minded conversations, taking a look at the labels together with our patients, uh, reading up on it, which is really going to be... Um, uh, is really what I recommend. It's interesting because you, uh, you know, when you think about, you know, say, the last doctor visit I had, they they're very particular about going through all the medications you're on. I don't think there's really a question, you know, in the HR like talk about your supplements that might not come up, uh, but you are suggesting, you know, physician kind of check into that in a non-judgmental way. Are there any kind of areas, you know, uh, you mentioned weight supplement, uh, kind of supplements about weight. Uh, I'm sure sleep disorders, things like that. Are there any other kind of particular areas that you would probe on? Well, I think it depends on what the, uh, what your patient's seeing you for. So I think if someone's struggling with something for a while, I'd ask, have you tried anything over the counter for that? Oftentimes when our patients respond to that, they'll just be thinking about, um, over the counter medications, of course, like ibuprofen or sedimentum. So you really have to ask the next question. Oh yeah, have you tried anything else? You know, things that are sold as supplements or other health products for that. So that, that's one thing to realize if you ask patients what they've tried for it, that might not cover it. They might be thinking over the counter medications is what you're asking about because oftentimes sort of in their mind, they're placing supplements in something that's not, it is not important for us to know about, the doctors to know about. It's just something that I'm taking on my own. So it's important to let your patients know that we want to know about that. It is important. And these can all interact. Um, I would say if I had a healthy person though, who didn't have any uh, concerns, I, 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 I guess my uh, number one in terms of area to ask about would be in terms of sports supplements. That's because a lot of really healthy patients who are exercising, um, the, the highest risk category of supplements they would be likely to try would be sports supplements. So I might say, oh yeah, with my patients who exercise regularly, they often are trying um, to take some pills or powder to enhance their workouts. Have you tried anything? Are you taking anything? And, and that conversation might yield some interesting opportunities to uh, learn about what our patients are taking and discuss with them some of the, the, the health uh, issues. Um, there is one thing, Todd, I do want to mention that it's very important. Once we do start these conversations with our patients that, and we believe that the supplement might have harmed our individual patient. So let's say it turns out that a patient developed a thyroid, uh, hyperthyroidism only after starting a supplement and you stop the supplement and went away. Well, those reports need really should be reported to the FDA. And the reason is that the FDA is relying on physicians to just spontaneously report what they're seeing in clinic, in the hospital, in the ED. So I can't um, emphasize enough how important it is to go to the FDA, go to MedWatch, and for us to submit those reports. Is that where someone would, a uh, physician would do that at that site, or how, how would they report that? Right. So it's the same process that we report, we would report for prescription medications. The thing is, most of us don't spend our time going to MedWatch and reporting side effects to prescription medications because these are uh, side effects or adverse events that are well-known, well-documented in the literature. And we don't feel obliged to because the FDA knows that, you know, um, that aspirin can cause bleeding. So we're not going to be reporting that. With dietary supplements, it's different. If you have a product and a patient started taking your product and develop a stroke, heart attack, it may or may not have been related. Go to the FDA's website, MedWatch, and report that. You're just giving the FDA the heads up. Hey, there was this association I saw between starting a medication and a serious event, uh, give it a heart attack or stroke, report those. Because the FDA has no other way of tracking safety of supplements. And like we talked about before, the FDA is responsible for removing dangerous supplements off the market. So it's really important that we, we as physicians are doing everything we can to get that information to the FDA when we see it in clinic, hospital, ED. 
Um, we talked a little bit about reform a few minutes ago. Um, you know, the, uh, the AMA updated and mon uh, modernized its dietary supplement policy, you know, at our meeting last November, which calls for exactly what you're talking about, which is, you know, more stringent federal regulation of dietary supplements, including increased oversight of manufacturing, marketing product, labeling, and, and, and what you just talked about, which is adverse re event reporting. You know, what do you want to see leaders in medicine and public policy, uh, you know, what role do you want to see them playing in achieving this type of reform? Well, I would love us to be out there in front. I, I think the AMA's new uh, policy is fantastic. I strongly support it. I, I think that we need to recognize as physicians that we need supplements to be both very high quality because we often will need them to treat our patients. Um, often our patients with iron deficiency, uh, vitamin deficiencies, they're going to need to rely on supplements. It's essential. And we, uh, we should be assured that when our patients go to the, go and purchase their supplement at whatever local store or on the internet, that they're high quality products. So we need to be um, real advocates for high quality and safety because of what's happened in the market, the, the, the new, the poor manufacturing, the challenges with manufacturing uh, issues and the challenges with new ingredients being put into supplements, we're dealing with currently an unsafe marketplace. So the question is, how do we ensure that we can both have access to high quality products, but ensure that the, the access is to safe products too? And that's really going to take a lot of us to get involved because, um, and the AMA's new policy is terrific in advocating for that and making sure that if there are any uh, proposals or any changes, new laws being proposed, that they are adequate to solve some of these problems we've been talking about and not just window dressing. Well, Dr. Cohen, this has been really interesting. Thanks so much for joining us today and sharing your perspective. Uh, you know, for more great content on AMA, please subscribe to our Moving Medicine podcast uh, and videocast. Uh, we'll be back soon with another segment. In the meantime, thanks for joining us and please take care.